So, um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Nikola Nikki Kazachorov. Um, and before introducing myself, I should say, please note, it's a bit of a typo there, uh, please note this presentation will not be shared due to copyright issues with regards to images. You're welcome to take notes, but please do not photograph the presentation apart from my book cover. Um, and so this rather brilliantly sets the tone for my talk, and I'll be talking about a lot of image uh, copyright issues within the humanities. Um, so I am a specialist in 19th and 20th century Russian and European art and visual culture. Um, and I finished my PhD in 2016. I'm currently a research fellow at Trinity Hall. And so my talk today is coming very much from an early career researcher perspective, as well as an art historical perspective. But I'm trying to speak in this talk to issues um, in the wider humanities. And my, I'll be addressing my first monograph, which is a co-edited volume, which you see on the right, which was published by Open Book Publishers in 2017, and my experience with open access in publishing this book. And I think I'm going to make a big claim here, so please tell me if I'm wrong. I think this book may be the first book in my discipline to be both open access as well as print on demand. Um, and I... I have a print copy of the book. You can look it up online, of course. Uh, but also raise the discussion about print books, go to Seven Access, so feel free to, to pass that around. So I'm going to be talking about the kind of the challenges and the benefits of open access uh, from an early career perspective. And here is more about the volume. There's a link up here if you've got your laptop or iPad out. Um, there are a number of precedents within art history uh, which are interesting to throw into this discussion in terms of open access. Uh, Courtauld Books Online is one of the new initiatives uh, in which we can download PDFs of monographs, and a colleague of mine at the Courtauld edits that. And in terms of journals, it's important to mention British Art Studies, which was co-published by the Paul Mellon Center as well as the Yale Center for British Art. Um, so just kind of touching upon this, because I'm, I'm talking largely today about the benefits and challenges of, of publishing art historical books in general. Um, but in terms of my book, uh, Modernism in the Spiritual and Russian Art, it was an edited collection arising from some of the papers from an academic conference I co-organized in 2012. Poster for that is on the left here in Cambridge with my, who would become my co-editor, Dr. Louise Hardiman. And this was, um, as PhD students, this was our first big academic conference that we ran. And the pap some of the papers from it were so rich that we decided to do a publication on one of the conference's central themes. And in terms of the timeline from the conference to the publication of the book, conference was in 2012. The book was published in 2017, so a five-year period. Um, and the question arises, why did we choose open access? Um, of all of the publishers out there. When we were first discussing the book in 2012, I think open access wasn't as discussed as much. And I, um, I wish I could say this is about a, our dedication, our commitment to open access at the time. Um, however, it was really down to my and my co-editors' outstanding experience with open book publishers here in Cambridge. Um, is anyone from open book here today, by the way? Oh, hi. <laughs> Sitting right next to each other, and I didn't realize. Um, open book publishers. Uh, so my, both my colleague and I submitted articles for the publication on the right, People Passing Rude, and we just had such good experience with them. And I think you know, those relationships in publishing and academia are extremely important. And OBP, I don't have to tell this audience that they have been absolutely pioneering in terms of open access books. And we're very glad we made this decision, but we're also very struck by their academic rigor as a publishing house. And respected colleagues of mine had published there. They were a publisher we trusted. Um, and we're also attracted to the relatively inexpensive cost of printing the book on demand, so sort of saving trees in that sense. Uh, and the book actually costs less when it's print on demand. So that was very attractive to us. Um, and out of OBP's books, I believe were their first major art history book. And we are both open access and publishers of print books, so that's quite a big deal in my discipline, as I mentioned. Um, 
and you can see the print copy I've passed around. We had a total of 11 contributors, including our introduction and articles by myself and my co-editor. So we had 10 authors, um, or nine authors, that were based in the UK, US, Italy, Germany, and Singapore, so quite um, an international demographic. We had all full color illustrations. Um, as an art historian, that's a, a very great prospect. Um, and we were told we could publish any number of images. Again, that's something that open access gives you rather than a print book. Um, and I'm going to get to issues with images in just a moment. I've been asked um, in this talk to address if any of our contributors needed convincing of the merits of open access and how we navigated that. Lots of academic articles are published online, but we found the idea of an ebook still had a certain stigma attached to it. I think that's changed since we started the book in 2012. Um, where people were associating online books with blogs and self-publishing without understanding now peer-reviewed monographs, peer-reviewed books of academic rigor are published um, online and sometimes exclusively so, as we see with Kotal books. And for me, open access was an important thing to consider because when you Google me, this book is what comes up. Um, not my peer-reviewed articles that are hidden behind a paywall, uh, which some academics have access to, some may not. So there was a sense of excitement about that, that anyone could read my research. Um, but there was also a bit of apprehension and the pressure to really get it right, um, get our facts straight. Um, so largely, I'm going to address the issue of artist and author copyright um, for images and creative works. And this is the majority of my talk because I'm an art historian. I cannot teach and I cannot disseminate research without images. It is part of the intellectual content of what I do. Students cannot learn without images. And this is certainly not um, just for art historians, but I think throughout the humanities as well. Um, and so I'm going to kind of discuss the, the boons and the pitfalls of open access and image copyright. And just to kind of walk you through image copyright laws, which I think everyone is very much familiar with. Uh, so the questions that you must ask are, who created the work? When did the creator die? Basic rules, the UK and Europe since January 1996. It's the life of the author artist plus 70 years, except for Spain, which is an exception. And I've listed some other exceptions here, um, letters, sound recordings, et cetera, which have slightly different dates. Um, so how, about, um, you know, I work on the early 20th century, so about half of the artists I work on um, died 70 years ago or more, and then the other half, we have to think about their image copyrights. Um, and just to say the above has been adapted from OBP author guidelines and copyrightuser.org. Um, so there's some crucial points to note here. Different copyright rules apply in different countries. If you're publishing a book in the States, um, I published a journal article in Russia. They have very different copyright laws, so you have to be cognizant of these shifts. And a reproduction or a recording of a public domain work often qualifies for copyright itself. And that is a really huge issue in terms of the cost of publishing images in the humanities. And an original adaptation or version of a public domain work is protected by copyright. Um, so just some important things to note here. And there's a brilliant website which OBP referred us to um, that's copyrightuser.org. And it's a great resource um, in terms of finding out these exact rules because you know we're, we're talking about legal issues here where if we get it wrong, we could be sued. Um, so this is very serious, very important to get it right. So there are sources like this that are out there. But in terms of our own experience, um, we, oh, and here's just a sample letter that the sorts of letters um, I have had to write and I'm sure others in this room have had to write um, to kind of beg for images and to have them potentially be free. Um, so writing as a, as a scholar, for working on a scholarly publication, and the sorts of rights um, that I've had to ask for. And the one that I want to kind of highlight here is this, because it's going to come up in a moment, non-exclusive rights to reproduce the item within my article targeted to a specialist audience, print and electronic rights, um, because this is a particular issue with open access. 
Um, so I've written this kind of letter many, many times. And we had to advise our authors, send them a template, and work with them and help them, all of our kind of 10 authors. Um, OBP were absolutely uh, wonderful and were extremely helpful. And they referred us to a number of websites which have images within the public domain and institutions who very kindly, uh, such as the Met and the Getty, that um, allow for scholars to use their images free of charge. Because it's, you know, in addition to getting the image, it, you have to get a high quality image as well. And you often have to go to the institute that owns that object. Um, Wicker Commons, Wicker Paintings were, were, were absolutely wonderful. Um, more and more images are in the public domain, more images of quality. Um, I should have maybe had a list of shame up here as well with institutions such as, I'm just going to go ahead and say it, the British Library, um, who charge a huge amount of money for images. Um, and it really varies institution by institution. Um, we, as we were publishing with all of our authors, we had to manage all of their image copyrights. Um, and again, you know, we would be liable if this became an issue. We had to get it right. We could not publish images that we didn't know exactly where they came from. So the, I, we had to update this image log, and this was rather a nightmare throughout the process. And I kind of lived in fear of this spreadsheet uh, for a very long time. But you can see the sorts of uh, questions that you have to ask about particular images. And I'll just highlight here, for our introduction, we largely used images from uh, Wikimedia Commons, uh, who, as I said, have excellent quality images available, but you have to kind of cite them properly. And I'm just going to, if I can find the mouse here, uh, just show you what this looks like. Again, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, but I think it's worth going through. Uh, let's close that window. Uh, so here's one of the images from our introduction. Artist who is definitely outside of that 70-year bracket, Alexander Ivanov. Is that coming up? Oh, sorry, everyone. I'm seeing it on my screen. Thank you. Um, so here, they very helpfully list that the work is in the public domain and who is the user who uploaded it because you have to, to credit them and we had to put that in our log um, and, and got an absolutely outstanding quality image here. Um. Oh, how do I? There we are. Oh, we have to go back to the beginning. Um, just leave this up here. And uh, I had my own article in my own book, a little bit self-serving, but I think it, it fitted very well with the collection. And I largely used my own photographs. Um, it was of a church, an interior of a church in Paris, that luckily I was able to take very high quality photos. Um, and I was the photographer, so I didn't need to ask permission. Um, so you find a lot of scholars taking their own photos where they can, uh, but when you're within a library and doing that, that's not allowed. You have to work with the library's imaging service. Um, and just some examples of the issues that we had, some more specifics. And one thing I really want to underline is that postgraduate students are largely unaware of copyright. And this is a huge issue. And one of our authors was a PhD student. Um, and she had significant issues with her images. We almost couldn't include them in the publication at all. Um, it was really in the kind of final hour of publishing we got them in. Um, she had accidentally lost her permission letter from one of the museums in Georgia, uh, the country Georgia. And she was not aware of a 70, the 70-year 70 copyright rule for artists. Uh, and she, when she was made aware, and it's absolutely you know, not her fault. This is not discussed with PhD students, at least in my department. Um, so it's totally understandable. And she had no idea about how to go about it. How do you define the, de the descendants of artists? Um, and this involves quite a bit of detective work. And she worked with the National Museum in Georgia. And at first, they weren't picking up the phone. They weren't getting back to emails. And she finally tracked down, I think, the grandson of one of the artists that she worked on. 
and took weeks and weeks to do this. And her permission involved screenshotting their Skype conversation, their Skype chat. And this had to be translated from Georgian and Russian into English um, so that everyone can see that the permissions were granted. Um, so these are some of the absurdities of having tra to track down the copyright holders for even a single image. Um, so we almost had to exclude these images. And so artist copyrights, it's largely about who you know in your field. Um, this artist, Nikolai Rodich, uh, I had written years ago to the Rodich Museum in New York and asked about the copyright holders. And they said, we don't know. I wrote to Christie's, they said, we don't know. And so then you've done your due diligence. And then subsequently, when colleagues were working on Rorich, I can say, well, I've got this letter from the director. I will forward it to you. Um, and in the kind of other case study I want to talk about with our book and the issue that arose, and this, this shows that there are real issues for open access in particular, because some of the issues I'm discussing, this is for print, printed books as well. Um, where the number of downloads in open access books cannot be calculated. They are always available online. They are available absolutely without restrictions. That is one of the benefits of open access. It's what we wanted to do with the book. Very happy about that. Um, but convincing image companies and rights holders of this can be very difficult. One of our author who already had to receive permissions at great personal expense, she paid 1,000 euros for her images in our book. Um, she applied for a contract that was limited to five years only. And a lot of image companies, this was Scala Images, uh, would only give her that five years. And they, she then subsequently asked if she could expand, um, sort of extend that in perpetuity. They said, we'll give you another five years so you can hold those rights for 10 years, but you have to pay another 1,000 euros. You know, and how can we ask our author to do that? Um, we absolutely cannot. And Another kind of notorious example of this is the Design and Artist Copyright Society, DAX, which, with whom I'm sure a lot of you are familiar. Um, I published an article in Word and Image, which is a great journal. They're behind a paywall, so they're not kind of open access. But again, we can't limit downloads, can we? Um, and DAX, it was, DAX is very expensive anyway. But they ask for the number of downloads. And on their website, I just looked yesterday, they have a chart with you know, 1,000 downloads, you pay this much. 2,000, you pay this much. Um, but so I couldn't pay this. Um, it's sort of impossible to do this. And we could, inc but I could include a link um, within the article to link to that particular image online um, in the collection where it was. So there are ways around this. But it really it takes detective work. It takes perseverance. Um, and I also had a great experience working with the Cambridge University Library's imaging service for that particular article, so I should mention that. Um, in terms of our cover image, and it's the last kind of example from this book, um, images for the cover need to be in the public domain or clear of copyright restrictions and of high enough quality for cover printing. And we had difficulties getting an auction house to agree to this image, which we wanted for our cover. It was our, our conference poster cover. It's very striking. Um, and the auction house sent their license over. And OBP referred to this as one of the most restricted licenses they'd ever seen. Um, they uh, said that the images had to, so they said, permissions for use on the internet stated clearly that the image must be non-downloadable and not usable for social media. So how am I going to advertise my book? Um, and so you know, clearly, the social media is essential. Um, and it's all, absolutely impossible to make the image non-downloadable. They also reserve the right to rescind permissions. Again, how do you do that with a book cover? Uh, they wanted us to inform them of every website hosting the image, which is also absolutely impossible with open access. Um, so rather than, I think this is an issue for open access, this is very important to address. However, I think this problem also stemmed from the fact that organizations are playing catch up in the digital age. You know, how, this is not sustainable for them to do that. It is virtually impossible to publish online without their agreement. So I think they're the ones who have to change eventually. This may seem like a minor issue, um, but covers where online and, or in print attract buyers, they help generate sales, they set the tone for the book's intellectual content. 
And as art historians, it meant a lot to get this right. Um, the OBP staff were absolutely brilliant. They helped us source the image for our cover, which was from Wikimedia Commons. And my co-editor, luckily, was a lawyer in a previous life. Um, so she was very helpful in navigating some of these issues. Um, and also, just one side note between uh, printed books and open access, the color of our cover, um, as you'll see as you're passing it around, is a bit different in tone. Um, so this was something we also had to consider. And as art historians, we were very fussy about colors and how images look. Uh, but again, that's something to consider in that, in that those covers will end up looking very different. Um, I just want to touch upon one other publication that I did that's not this edited volume, but an article I published in the journal Art History. And this is kind of my most absurd image copyright anecdote. Um, that I have. So in total for the article, I had to pay 300 pounds um, to get image permissions, and this was for a handful of images. I largely got free images from auction houses, which with whom I have a very good relationship. I was an art dealer in a previous life. Um, so a lot of this is about the relationships you have with people, and private collections as well. And one of the images um, was from a provincial museum in Russia in Western Siberia, and they asked for 500 rubles for its publication. I've been corresponding with the curator in Russian, and 500 rubles is about five pounds. And I said, great, I'll bank transfer it to you. And they said, well, we can't accept a bank transfer of money that low. And so I thought, how on earth am I going to do this? You know, next colleague who goes to Russia, do I give, slip them a fiver and they go and pay this? through the post, and I was going back and forth with this, this curator, and she went and paid it for me. And it was, you know, so amid these kind of tales of horror, there are stories of kindness and generosity of curators, of librarians, who understand that we want our work out there. Um, and I think for this museum, who's largely unknown, to have a work published in an English journal was, was quite a cool thing. Um, so, Anyway, just to say that there are very kind people who are supportive of publications. Um, so the issues that I'm talking about don't just affect art historians, but the wider humanities. It also applies to film and text. Um, a colleague of mine had was asked to pay thousands of dollars to include text uh, by the American poet Wallace Stevens from his, uh, from his estate. So she had to change the content of her book to reflect that. Um, and I also want to raise this issue for PhD students uh, who are facing questions about direct deposit for their PhDs. Um, it raises this kind of separate issue of students, you know, they have to think about image copyright. They have to be very aware of these laws and these issues. And also, they may not want their PhD as accessible as it could be. They may not want it as available given that our, you know, our PhDs, they're, they're very good, but they're largely in a format that we consider unfinished. We're going to prepare them for publication in a monograph, in a peer-reviewed article. Um, and so we, ha and we have to be very protective of our own ideas and our own work. So putting them out there in that way, um, you know, for some people, is rather difficult. And as an early career researcher, I will be taking on PhD students soon. So what do I advise them? And just in terms of all these problems and these this sort of stream of complaints you're getting in my talk today, um, I would propose, and please jump up if I'm wrong, if there's not something already within the university for this, a center or a person or some sort of workshops or training that is available for particularly postgraduate students in the humanities, early career researchers like myself, to help us navigate these issues. They are very serious. We have to get them right. Um, so that would be fantastic. I think that's why this symposium today is so brilliant, because we can have this kind of cross-departmental dialogue across the university and come together and address these issues. Um, finally, I'm running out of time here, but I just wanted to get back to our publication um, and our co-edited volume and why open access is brilliant. So I've done a lot of complaining about image copyrights, um, but going a bit slowly, so I'll, I'll kind of mention what I'm about to show here is I love OBP for this. They show you the distribution of your book and who is reading your book. And this is 
has been so kind of thrilling for us, particularly as early career scholars. Sorry, it's being very slow. Um, so you can see here, our publication has been read since 2017, its publication 6,420 times, uh, which, oh, can they not see it? Thank you. Um, but anyway, just what I'm about to show you is OBP has a map of who has read your work where, and that's brilliant for us to see if we're reaching scholars in, in Russia. I have a lot of colleagues in Russia who cannot read my work because it is hidden behind paywalls, um, and these are colleagues who, are in, who cannot benefit from the kinds of institutional support that we have in the UK, Europe, and the States, um, so they are... Uh, you know, I'm just going to skip it because this is a bit too difficult. Um, anyway, it has a, you can check it out online. There's a brilliant map that shows you that distribution. Um, I thought 6,000 reads was pretty good, but one of OBP's books, Women in 19th Century Russia, has been read 45,000 times since 2012. Um, and kind of talking about research impact, you know, it's brilliant to have these figures at your fingertips. And I think also students increasingly use online sources. Um, and we need to provide them with more open access sources that are scholarly and reputable. And my book was put on the reading list in our department uh, for a course on Russian art, which was very exciting. Um, so I think it, it allows our research to be um, easily accessed by students. And even, I'm running out of time here, but even the other day, I was trying to look up something in my own book, which academics in the room, I'm sure you've all done that. Uh, but I had the paper copy book on my bookshelf, and I had my computer, and I looked it up online really quickly. And maybe that was out of laziness, but I think there is a user-friendly nature to particularly kind of OBP's design and how it's used um, that meant that that was my kind of go-to in that moment. So finally, some conclusions. My experience with open access was very positive. I'm really glad I did it. I'm very glad I did it with OBP. Uh, my research has been spread far more widely than I have ever thought it would. It's available to students. And also, as someone who's interviewing for jobs uh, this year, it shows my commitment to open access and my knowledge of open access as well. But the biggest challenge if open access becomes a requirement is copyright. Even though image copyrights are a concern for both print and e-editions of journals and books, I think the increase of open access publications gives us a platform from which to begin discussing ways to solve these issues. It affects my field in particular, but images, texts, films in the humanities and sciences, um, the sort of cost of research, the literal cost. Um, and one of my colleagues flagged up Catherine Rudy is an art historian. She's written an article in the Times Higher Education Supplement about the costs for her book. So I do suggest that you look that up. And so this has particularly a detrimental effect on early career researchers who do not have the institutional funding or support to assist them. In turn, these restrictions limit and dictate the kind of knowledge we are able to disseminate. So should I only be teaching or writing about artists who are available on Wikicommons or artists who are out of copyright? What do I suggest my PhD students research on? Um, and so my suggestion is, again, to have some sort of person or center at the university, some sort of workshopping that goes on within departments where this issue is further discussed. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. That was, uh, uh, that was terrific. And, uh, but it, um, uh, brought back um, levels of guilt for, for me because I used to be a, a regular recipient of those letters asking mm. for copy, mm. copyright clearance. Uh, and if I could just reflect a little mm -hmm. on that sort of experience. I mean, it is, it is a, an incredibly expensive uh, process for the institution mm -hmm. and very, um, I suppose, very frustrating mm -hmm. because we have a sense of um, uh, authors you know, struggling, and, and, and I think in, in the, the years when I did this, they had been handed that process by the publishers, sure. who very often did it for them um, mm. up until about perhaps about 15, uh, mm. 15 years ago. Um, what uh, the, the, the range of requests tends to come from, from sort of the, the 200 to 400 um, copy print runs. 
mm. or, or equivalent in, in the digital world to um, major textbook publishers mm. who expect to run off 20,000 copies. Sure. Um, did you come across any models that might mm. be adopted by mm -hmm. institutions mm. that might come out a, you know, that something we could buy into as a, as a university mm. for a start or with, with similar institutions mm. that would particularly help those who are expecting the equivalent of an academic print run? Mm. No, I think that's a, the, your, the question you raised is extremely important because I'm very much discussing these from an author's point of view. And it's important to think about staff who are working in the libraries and in the museums who often cannot make these decisions themselves or, or are for, forbidden to um, by the rules within their institution. In terms of models, um, I think a lot of the um, institutes I had up on that one slide are fantastic, such as Getty, um, the Met, that I think the Met, some of their images are available, some are not. And I think that this is going to hopefully be changing within institutions who will be looking at those models because also of the pressure to digitize collections mm -hmm. online and have their collections available to the public. Um, so I'm hoping this, this is something will shift and that people will start to follow those models. Did that answer your question? Yeah, they, I, I think it, it does. I mean, I, I think the, you know, the idea of having a center for, for mm -hmm. training in copyright claims is fine, but it does return the problem to the researcher. And I mm -hmm. wondered how much actually that five-year period between the mm. symposium and publication mm. was actually taken up with mm. the, these sort of issues because you want to publish when the, the research is fresh. Absolutely. Um, I think it, it, it was important for me to note in that five-year period that was largely down to our authors um, with varying difficulties and waiting upon them for their material. And actually, something I forgot to... Um, well, in, in terms of the image copyrights, I think it just meant that there was a kind of in really intense two months where we had to work very closely with our authors on each individual image. And we found that most of our authors didn't really know the copyright laws and the rules, and we had to work with them very, very carefully. And I think you're right to emphasize that the onus is largely falling upon the researchers and the authors, and there needs to be more dialogue on the other side um, of that kind of license agreement um, as well. And also, one thing I should have mentioned about OBP that was really brilliant, their turnaround time is outstanding. Um, I think we sent everything for it to be proofed in kind of mid-September 2017, and the book was out by November. So that's kind of having done the edits and it coming back to us and then having it back to them. So that is one of the huge benefits of that as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, how would you define fair use? <laughs> So do you, what do you, fair use as in images in the public domain or, um, I mean, I, that's not a term that I have come across, fair use. Fair use in the UK, it's in the US oh, that's why. <laughs> it's fair deal in the UK. I'm sorry, someone could say that a bit louder. In the UK, third dealing. Fair dealing. Okay. Great. Um, sorry, if, if you could maybe pass the microphone, because I think I'm maybe not the best person to answer this question. I can comment it on it from my point of view, um, but. Just, just quickly on images. Fair dealing is pretty. It's, it's hard because it's the entire image, mm -hmm. but. For things like music or videos, uh, it is potentially usable. Uh, but for, a, for an image like this, it wouldn't have come up. Sorry, it wouldn't have come up in, in, in this type of book at all because you've taken the whole image, which is uh, more than um, allowed under fair deal. Hmm. Did you have anything to add? Uh, about? Thank you very much. No, just, just that um, at uh, CDP um, we, in, and in the UK, we, we consider fair dealing to, to just apply to, to text. Small percentages of text, like a whole image. 
and it's, it's, a, it's a small percentage of the text that can be used for academic purposes right. and criticism without uh, having to get permission. Great, thank you. And that explains my total ignorance of that because I don't work on text. Um, but thank you very much for that. So with images, uh, sounds like a very different story. But for text, as I mentioned, a colleague of mine you know, trying to publish um, work of an American poet. Uh, and Martin, in his talk, mentioning working on contemporary writers. And so I think in terms of being aware of how much text that you're actually publishing um, is very important. Uh, I can see a number of other questions coming up, but we are running a bit out of time. So I think if you can ask questions to Nikki during the break, I think that would be best. Um, thank you, everyone, for the first session. Um, we do have tea and coffee outside. Um, we'll be back here in about 20 minutes to stick, kick off the next part of this first session. Thank you. <laughs>